Hello, I'm Lydia, and you're listening to Lens from the Fens. Welcome to my second episode for Lens from the Fens. I hope that everyone is well and they have been enjoying the very nice weather we've had despite uh, being still in lockdown. If you have already listened to my first episode, I hope that you thoroughly enjoyed it. If not, uh, you're more than welcome to go back and listen to that before I carry on with the topic of today, which I have decided to do the brief history uh, about the Fens landscape. So I'll give you a general idea of the landscape that I live in um, and how it came to be. So the facts and information I collected for this episode uh, comes from a book titled The Fens, which I received as a present earlier this year. And it is written by archaeologist Francis Pryor, who has been conducting archaeological studies and digs over the past 40 years. He also appeared on the Time Teen television show, and was the main excavator of Flag Fen, based in Peterborough, which I'll provide more information on a little later on in this episode. So the Fens lies on the east coast of the UK. It's made up of 1 million hectares of low-lying land, which basically forms the inland extension of the Wash, which is England's largest bay. And if you were to look at the United Kingdom map, it is very noticeable curvature into uh, the English coast, uh, which stems from the North Sea. So several rivers flow through most of the fens, those being the River Witham, the River Nen, Great Ouse and the River Welland, which is the river closest to where I live. And they all come uh, out through the Wash and then into the North Sea. So the fens is divided into two areas, the Silt Fens to the north and the Peat or Black Fens further in the south. The Silt Fens is deposited by tidal waters off the North Sea and in contrast to the peat fens which gives the black fens their distinctive soil colour formed out of freshwater ponds, fens and meres all fed by rivers uh, that flowed into the Fenland Basin. So the silt fens is found within Lincolnshire and around the Wash and the black fens is located more towards the centre and the south so mostly within Cambridgeshire and extends into parts of Norfolk and Suffolk. Where I live, which is between the town Spalding and the small city of Peterborough, there is a feature of successive episodes of fresh and salt water deposits. So comparing this to both fens, uh, the peat, which is composed of semi-decayed remains of materials such as reeds, rushes, shrubs and grasses, growing on wet ground, but then fail to break down the soil due to waterlogging. So on the scale of things, the peat fens, which is due south, they tend to be a lot flatter and lower lying land. And this then results in the effect of drainage causing the peats to shrink and be blown away. So in comparison to the silt fens, silt is obviously a mineral where the grain size lies in between being a fine grained clay to sands and even up to uh, gravels and shingles. So this then makes it less prone to shrinkage and wind erosion. So throughout uh, Francis's studies, he developed a key interest in the draining of the Fens, and it was during his pursuit of the Roman, medieval and modern history, he then learnt that the past provided answers and truths to help us unlock problems facing today's world. So as I said earlier, Francis was one of the main excavators at Flag Fen, based in Peaceborough. It is a Bronze Age site, which I have visited a few times when I was younger, either on the school trips or with family members. It is said that the site was developed around 3,500 years ago and is made up of a plethora of timbers and brushwood. These have been laid out to create a causeway made up of five long rows of tall sharpened stakes embedded within the marsh. So it is believed that the Bronze Age community uh, then created a platform for which people can walk over either for travelling or to transport livestock and food. It is said that the estimated amount of timbers is 60,000 pieces. Um, 
um, more findings and discoveries have been made since uh, Pryor's first initial excavations, which took place in 1982. Um, if you wanted to find out more information about Flagfen, uh, this can be found through the Vivacity website. Simply uh, search for Heritage Venues on their website and then Flagfen will appear as an option. So as I said a little bit earlier, Spalding is the closest town uh, near to where I live. And that place also holds quite a bit of history, specifically within the horticultural industry. So Spalding is renowned for its uh, flower industry, uh, which is heavily reliant on our European neighbours, especially uh, the flower markets within the Netherlands. Uh, so Spalding is probably one of the main centres of the English flower industry. Uh, quite a few years back, uh, there would be fields and fields of tulips uh, which lined the road in and out of Spalding and I do remember I was relatively young but a few times travelling into Spalding from another town I lived in there was just rows and rows of red yellow and white tulips which just scored through all the fields so from the 1950s and 70s uh, people travelled across the county and even from abroad to Spalding for the annual tulip parade, which consisted of uh, floats which were created by groups and organisations and they were just absolutely covered in tulips and other sorts of flowers that the town grew. And it was also the feature of the Tulip Queen who travelled through the town with the floats and it would just be quite a national event, so pictures were printed across newspapers all over the nation. This continued until later on in the 20th century where unfortunately the tulip fields became damaged by various diseases and viruses. Uh, this in turn resulted in a larger variety of flowers then being planted over the last few decades. Some of this uh, includes daffodils, peonies and a selection of delphiniums. It was also from this change that um, it became the flower parade from the tulip parade. Again, I witnessed it when I was quite young, um, which, which was really nice to see. It was nice to see a tradition uh, carried on through the years. But during the last sort of decade, uh, the tulip uh, harvesting wasn't very successful due to the colder winters. And in turn, the events eventually uh, no longer got funded to run. And unfortunately, the last parade uh, was held in 2013. Which is a shame, um, but I think just in terms of the complications that were found while the tulips were being grown and then sent off elsewhere, um, it, it just it had to end, unfortunately. So in the book, as I mentioned a little earlier on, um, Francis tells so many great tales of his archaeological discoveries and uh, the studies he conducted. But he was also really good at talking about how the landscape uh, has been inspiring to him as well. Um, in terms of the landscape can provide a variety of past achievements and also reveals a bit about the lives of people and societies uh, a few hundred years ago. Uh, a lot of the surrounding villages, including my own within Lincolnshire, um, as quoted by Francis, uh, contains some of the finest churches in Britain, which I pretty much agree with. There, there's a lot uh, surrounding the area uh, of Spalding and further, and it is in amongst the churches that there's also other structures which provide clues as to how building materials were sourced um, earlier on in the century, as stone was a hard material in which to find. So from this, uh, it's evident that some of the houses near here were built from mud and stud, which is a mixture of earth and straw, and this can be found in the white walled cottages with thatched roofs. As well as those, there are other structures across Lincolnshire and into Cambridgeshire, uh, which hold, again, quite a, a bit of recent history, actually. Uh, these include the pillboxes, which are the hexagonal, one-storey um, buildings with the slit windows and the machine gun posts alongside, which uh, provides a, a bit of a stark reminder of the threat that Britain faced of an invasion from across the North Sea between the years 1940 and 1941. So as well as the historical findings, the, the landscape also provides a fair amount of inspiration for uh, creative individuals. 
There has been artists, photographers like myself, and writers and musicians across the years. Again, Francis uh, put it uh, really well that although places like the Highlands and the Lake District, the Peak District, uh, might be more automatic in terms of the land structure, he also believes that the Friends are no exception from that. And this is where some of my memories actually come into it because I would often see a huge contrast of light and dark throughout the year and it is just the fact that you are totally surrounded by sky and the image of my podcast actually shows that that was taken from um, the river bank uh, of the river Welland again which is uh, near, near my village so another quote by Francis which I, I can relate to a lot is that the Fens is an infinite dome of sky um, which I, I I just agree with. It is just the sky that surrounds you, especially in the summer. It's just when the sky is clear blue, you could just see the blue, which is really nice. And then at night time, when the stars are out, again, if it's a clear night, you can just see thousands and thousands of stars due to there being quite low light pollution. And it is just a vast, infinite sky of either clear blue skies um, or stars. Another thing you mentioned is that a lot of Fens folk appear to be more attuned with nature because of this. So a lot of people, uh, farmers or just people who live in these communities, they can learn the habits of the changing weather, they can see whether storms are incoming but then again they can also see the clear skies beyond that so they could work out how long the storm would last. The mists and fog that come off uh, the wash that can just envelop across fields and then filter through the villages dotted across the fens. And another thing that I experience is the cold frets in the winter. You, you just can't avoid it because there is no cover. It can just completely shroud the whole area in, in very, very cold temperatures. But from that, you get a really nice scenes of uh, the dew and the frost that lay across the fields as well. So I do highly recommend, if you want to learn more about the Fens history, uh, to purchase the book, The Fens by Francis Pryor. Uh, it just contains a lot more to do with the tales that Francis uh, talks about, the dis discoveries he made, and either if you live in the Fens or you live outside of it, I think it's a, a good read for anyone who is particularly interested in history or just genuinely intrigued by uh, wanting to know more about the Fens years and years ago. So as I mentioned a bit earlier, the River Welland is the river that is closest to me and it's been a feature throughout most of my childhood all the way up to today. I would either be travelling along it any time of day to or from work or uh, going into one of the city centres in Peterborough and there is just always something to see, day or night. Um, in the daytime, there would be all sorts of birds and mammals. But at night time, there would actually be quite a number of owl species as well. So barn owls is quite a big feature during the winter months. There would often be three or four individuals flying around in the same area. So the road that I mostly go along, uh, the, um, which is running alongside the river, is a bank uh, just outside of my village. It's probably about um, a mile and a half uh, on some back roads. The bank itself, from the water level to the top of the road, is about 10 metres tall. So it's probably one of the highest <laughs> viewpoints um, uh, closest to me. And it allows more scope across the fields. And from that, you can actually see the lines of drainage ditches and dikes uh, that run between them. And it was actually from finding out about this, I could see how mammals uh, such as deer used them as cover when they were moving across fields in daylight for food or just uh, general travel. So it was really nice to see those. It was probably last summer where I was travelling on that road and I could see three roe deer in the field. They had just come out the dike. And they were just laying in the field, either grazing or just enjoying the sun. So that was really nice. So going back to the river, again, the life that lives either on or next to the river, there's just a huge abundance of it all year round. When I was younger, I would often spot the mute swans 
and the cygnets when they were hatched. Uh, mallards often see grey herons. They would often be perched on the edge of the bank, ready to strike at any fish that they see. And it was as I developed my birding knowledge, I then realised that there is actually a lot, lot more than what I saw when I was younger. So some of these species include goosanders in the winter, uh, tufted duck, cormorants often feed along there. They'd either be eating a uh, big fish or I actually witnessed one trying to eat an eel, which is uh, quite amusing. Didn't have my camera at the time, but again, it just shows you that wildlife, it's wildlife for a reason. Um, and then one particular species that I managed to track for the most part of the year were a family of great crested grebes. So I first uh, noticed a pair who were doing the mating dance quite early on. I think it was two years ago. Again, didn't have my camera, <laughs> but um, it was nice to witness them doing the mating dance where they lifted pretty much the whole front of the bodies out of the water, the necks elongated, and they'd have weed in their mouth and the feathers around their head uh, would be pushed forward like a mane which is just uh, a really nice thing uh, to witness, um, just so close to home. So weeks went by, I would uh, travel up to the riverbank, I would either sit in my car, um, just so I was out of the way and I wasn't spotted it easily, but I then realised I could uh, get out the car, go down the side of the bank, because it would often be quite overgrown with grass uh, and different types of plants, so I would just sit amongst the grass um, with my back to the bank facing towards the river. And and yeah, they just didn't seem bothered at all. So I would just sit there, have my camera out. And over time, I watched a pair build their nest where the male would bring bits of reed or grass from the water's edge to where the nest was being built by the female, which was actually right in the middle of the river. And I realised later on uh, why they did this. So I then saw the female with eggs, again a few weeks later, she was sitting on them, the male was off hunting further down river, and then there was a bit of a break in between from when the eggs hatched to uh, when the chicks were a little bit older. So it was when I went back around this time that there were three really healthy chicks, they were quite big as opposed to when they would be when they were first born, so they couldn't they tried to get on their parents' back when I last photographed them, which is quite amusing. Um, but I assumed it was around the time that they were being taught how to feed for themselves. So this particular, well, it was quite early evening, um, again, drove up to the bank, walked down the bank and sat in amongst the grass. And the three chicks were actually in the middle of the river, where I then realised that there were a lot of reeds, um, quite high... There was just a huge clump of it in the middle and they actually used this area in which to um, float in because the amount of reeds that were there it actually slowed the current of the river so they in this area they weren't at risk of being taken downstream so the chicks were just floating there the parents went off caught fish and then brought it back for them so yeah that was uh, really nice to see and it was just wonderful to record the same birds and see the chicks grow and then a bit later on I would so I saw the chicks who were now independent uh, hunting for themselves their stripes from when they were first born were starting to disappear about to turn into an adult so I'm assuming that they're probably still living on that river uh, as adults and hopefully either this year if I get the chance to I'll be able to see uh, the newborn chicks uh, from the chicks that I saw a couple of years ago. So that is my quite brief history on the fens, uh, how the land came to be and the wildlife I've recently or have found in the area. Again, if you want to learn more about the fens history, I recommend the book The Fens by Francis Pryor, um, an amazing uh, archaeologist and he has so many more tales to tell of his discoveries of the fens. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will be hopefully back with another one in the next week or so. And this will be uh, the beginning of where I talk more about uh, wildlife photography in my area, providing some hints and tips on photography and field craft. And yeah, I'll be happy to 
tell you more of the stories I've encountered throughout the last few years. So I hope you all stay safe and I will be talking to you all again very soon. My podcast cover shows my own image created using Canva. The theme music is provided by Purple Planet Music. Check out their royalty-free music at purple-planet.com. Thank you.